Hey, Phil. How you doing? I am great. How are you? Oh, let me make myself appear. Yeah, I'm like, can you see me? I can't see you. Yes. Right. Hold on. Oh, oh there, there we I go. Am. Amazing. Uh, hey, how are you? I am so good. I'm so <laughs> happy that you want to do this. That's, thank you oh. so much. Likewise, thank you. Um, how, do I pronounce your na name? Is it Tia? Tia, is, yeah. That's what yeah, I, I use when I speak English because the how, Finnish how do you do pronunciation. It, how do you do it in Finnish? Tia. Tia. So it just sounds like a D. Anyways. <laughs> How's life uh, in how's, how's life in Finland? It's good. Summer is here, which is amazing. Oh, oh it's the best. <laughs> um, yeah, I've had a long day today filming, but um, what, what, what are we working on? I work on this like a reality TV show as a okay. production coordinator. <laughs> okay, is it going well? It is. Yeah, today was a very chill day. We were like in a spa, so we okay. didn't have to do anything. We were just sitting there waiting for the oh, camera how, guys to film them <laughs> we how finish you guys were in the when the sauna oh well <laughs> um <laughs> it was this weird thing where they went into these tanks filled with uh -huh. salty water and okay. the point was that you just float in there for an hour uh, i've done that i've done that yeah yeah so, and you like cover, you cover your eyes and cover your ears and yes yeah, yeah. it's, it's very weird it's um you start to <laughs> you actually start to hallucinate um yeah, that's because, what I heard. I was yeah, it's like your your like your body can't tolerate like not having any um, input, and, yeah. and so it just starts making stuff up, yeah. which is crazy. It's just yeah. it it doesn't take any time at all for your brain to just start like improvising. Yeah, yeah. I was like, <laughs> I want to try this, but I didn't. Today was the work day, so but no sauna, unfortunately. But anyway, <laughs> how are you? Where are you in the world? Are you like I, at home and? Yes, I'm at home. Actually, I need to, oh, sorry, I just got off my exercise bike, so I'm still oh. sweating, which, which is not good for photography. I'm going to try to turn the temperature down a little bit. It's a little warm here. Yeah, fair. Yeah, you look very sunny. Oh, that's here so in nice. Los Angeles. Yeah, look up. Yeah, this looks beautiful. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> but it's always sunny here. and Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> so... Should we just get going? Yeah, whatever you'd like to do. Yeah, awesome. We will start with a question of, okay. you're the showrunner of Legends. How would you describe, like, what do you do for a living? Like, what is the showrunner? What are the jobs that you do in Legends? Mm. <laughs> I mean, showrunner is, I, you know, it means the head writer to, to a lot of people. I guess showrunner implies that, you know, you're in charge of, you know the three aspects of production you have the you have the writing you have the production you have the post production a showrunner um kind of has oversight over all of those separate spheres so what you you know you get to see episodes all the way through the pipeline that's it's it's one of these terms that nobody like up until like 10 years ago like people in the real world never used terms like showrunner because it's a yeah. very like industry term but once showrunners started to get famous you know yes. once you started to have like name brand showrunners then everybody I guess started to want to know what the term means but it's like you know it's like people ask me like what's producer and you're like I, I don't know it means it could it could mean it, it's it's so you know every it could be anything it could be anything yeah <laughs> do you have a favorite part like if there's like writing production and post-production do you have a favorite bit to be involved in or do you just enjoy the whole journey mm, I mean primarily I consider myself a, a writer and I got into the business to to become a writer yeah. and so you know I like to be surrounded by other writers I like the spontaneity I like the camaraderie you know the thing that I, I like about tv writing is it's very social because you know you get to to break the story as a group and then you get to go off and write it as a as an individual. And so it sort of marries like the best aspects of, you know, writing can be a very solitary pursuit and, and it yeah. can be very frustrating. Yes. And um, if you're prone to uh, insecurity, to not have another person to help you formulate your ideas or to vet them, to let you know what's good and what's stupid. Like I, I can't write by myself uh, or I can't break stories by myself. But then again, once in a while you, you know, we, we are, introspective people who do like to be left alone with our thoughts and so like it's it's a really 
you know, whenever you get sort of tired of the company, you get to go off and write a script yeah. and, and then you get to bring it back and then, and then you get to pass it off to very dedicated, brilliant people who bring it to life. And, you know, I don't, my brain doesn't work like a, a director. And so I'm always happy to go to set and watch it happen. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I feel like I'm out of my element. I'm always like a guest and I'm sort of, I kind of feel a little bit useless because I mean, every, every these people bring our stories to life without, yeah. you know, I can answer the occasional question, Yeah. but it's also the pace at which things work and the fact that you're not in control. You know, you know what it's like to work in physical production. It's like, you can't make it go faster you <laughs> yeah. can't you know it's when things are going wrong there's only so much you can do to mitigate that and there are people who really thrive off of that intensity um i find it frustrating and intimidating and then i mean post production is wonderful because again there's there's no time limitations you know you could just sit there in the dark as long as you like yeah. and, and and tweak and you know it's it's very scientific, you know, um, yeah. and so that that's a very like it's creative, but it's also like very quantitative, you know what I mean? It, so I mean that's the great thing about being a TV writer or a showrunner. It's like you know whenever you get bored of any one thing, you can just be like, oh, I'll go do another thing. And with network TV, you have episodes that are in all aspects of production at the same time, so you can always, you know, you can always dabble. You never have to get like um, bored doing one thing. Yeah. Do yeah. you often go to set? I mean, before the pandemic, I mean, I shouldn't lie. There are people who love set and people who like, you know, you can't get them away. They're like, yeah. uh, I, I am not one of those people. I right. really immensely enjoy everyone's company, but I would, I always kind of retreat back to the writer's room because that's my like safe place. But, you know, the pandemic kept us from visiting set because, you know, the show is shot up in Canada and we had that yeah. international border. And so, yeah, it was probably almost two years that I was unable to visit. And, you know, my whole life was like, like this. It like was all, yeah. yeah, all the production meetings were like this. All the yeah. writer's room was like this. All the editing was like this. So, you know, your, your brain slowly gets scrambled and um, yeah, hopefully it will recover someday. Yeah, <laughs> but it is, I think it is crazy. We've talked about this with like a few people, how even though we were all in a pandemic mode, but then mm -hmm. somehow you guys made like two of the best seasons of the show <laughs> in many oh, people's opinions. Or it's like, you know, I remember when season six aired or like mm -hmm. started airing. I remember mm. being nervous of like, <laughs> I don't this know if we'll be, be able weird. to see. Yeah. Like, can we mm. see that it's weird or like, mm -hmm. can you see it in the show or, or I, I didn't know what to expect because the whole world was like, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. So, there's a couple places you can see it. I mean, I was thinking about episode uh, 603, the one that's like the futuristic talent competition yeah. with, the, with the robot guest. And, you know, the fact that we didn't have any live audience. True, you know, they were was, all on the screen. Yeah, they're all screens. <laughs> you know, that was, we, you know, we didn't know like how many extras we would be able to have and whether it was safe and what physical proximity. And also, yeah. you know, there's the scene with um, Zari and, and Constantine when they're, it's, they're, they're very, it's very kind of sexy sort of post-coital yeah. story or whatever but you, you know yeah. they're kind of their faces are far away from each other and you know because I mean we I don't we couldn't have people kiss and yeah we, we, yeah we, we we honestly didn't know what was safe and whether we were going to get shut down at any moment so we were, yeah. we were we were trying to be cautious at the time yeah, yeah. I think it turned out great <laughs> oh so. thank you I, I'm very fond of the alien alien season as well the alien season <laughs> yes so if we go back to the beginning mm -hmm. because you've been there the whole time mm -hmm. are there many people who've been there like the whole time or are you like um i mean <laughs> i'm the only one who's been from the very whole time i think yeah yeah, yeah. because the series was picked up without a pilot which is a bit of a unusual um thing in network tv right I, you know they had shot like a little three minute sizzle reel i don't know if that's out there in the world anywhere it was like a sales tool and so okay um uh the director uh dermot downs shot this thing 
And instead of there being a pilot that was written, they brought in all the actors and shot this little sizzle reel that was used to get the show picked up directly to series. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, when I was brought on, there was no pilot. So Mark Guggenheim and I wrote the pilot ourselves as we were also starting the season one room. And then the, sh yeah. the, sh the show, as you remember, premiered as part of the, the crossover event. Yes. Um, yeah. So that, you know, there, there, there have been people um, who were there for the whole run. Um, you know, Mark stayed on as a producer for the whole run. Keto Shimizu was there for every season. And, you know, it was a fairly stable group of writers though. You know, most, most of the people were with the show for multiple seasons. And, you know, actually, I mean, the weirdest thing is that we, we brought on people during the pandemic. So we had writers that actually never got to be in a writer's room. So um, right. that was like That's the cra craziest thing. Like um, Marcy came on in season six and then yeah pay, pay and mercedes came on in season seven yeah and i mean eventually we met these people but we had not previously met them and still yeah. have not worked in a writer's room yeah uh, which is the craziest thing yeah. yeah so when you joined the show do you know how the show started what was like how did legends like mm how was it birthed <laughs> like where did the idea come from i think that was uh, someone's like someone else yeah and they were like who had the idea that this would be good television and i want to thank them because it is and it's <laughs> and, you know <laughs> i should know the answer to this as and to, to the best of my knowledge yeah. it was you know the head of the cw mark pedowitz must have talked to greg berlanti who then talked to mark guggenheim and the showrunner of flash yeah. And I guess this was, you know, this was eight or nine years ago. So this was, I guess Avengers was either, I don't know, Avengers was a thing. And so the yeah. idea was like, why don't we do a DC thing? Yeah. Um, and then I was brought in kind of last. Yeah. When I came in, the show was sort of already set up, which is a very rare thing. Like normally you have to go out and pitch the show and make the pilot and, you know, Usually, usually it never works. So this was like one of those rare opportunities where it's like, no, this is a series. This is going to happen. Yeah. This, this is real. So yeah. like in one sense, that's like really wonderful, but it's also like, you know, season one, we didn't get a chance to spend a lot of time pressure testing it or yeah. reiterating any of our ideas. It was kind of like, just go make the show. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I know there's a huge sort of, theme of like season one was one thing and the rest of the show was another and you know it to a sense that narrative like might be true but you know it's also like we were learning on the fly which yeah. normally you have a chance to do that like on the page before the rest of the world sees it yes <laughs> you know season one was basically us being like okay let's figure out what the show is or what it could be yeah well, I don't know. How how do you feel about it? That that was also someone's question mm -hmm. about like the progress of like starting the season one pretty serious mm -hmm. and a very different tone to then yeah. like where it kind of ended up or where it yeah. like went to. Yeah. How was that yeah. part? Or was it intentional? Was that the plan the whole time? Or how did that happen? <laughs> um, well, no, that wasn't the plan for sure. Um, you know, I think a lot of the kind of seriousness of the first season was just kind of b baked into the concept because you had like immortal villain, um, yeah. you know, family who was murdered, yes. um, a, a, a bunch of like reject superheroes who are kind of made a part of a team because they're expendable and you know, they, have, yeah. they have no contribution. There's a lot to, of grim to, stuff. A lot of grim stuff, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so we did that and it's, you know, we learned a few things like immortal bad guys, very difficult because you're just like, <laughs> oh, every episode you're going to chase him and fail until the very end where presumably he dies. So yeah. you're like, you can, you can kind of intuit what the, the season is before you've ever seen it if you, <laughs> yeah, if you, if you know there's an a eternal a immortal bad guy. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, as far as tone, you know, the show wasn't a smash hit. And then, you know, season two idea was like, why not? You know, because there was a sort of disconnect between the way we talked about the show and what the show was, because the writer's room has always been a very irreverent, silly, goofy, fun place. Yeah. And so the idea was like, why don't we take the energy that is being used to manufacture the show and have it actually appear in the show? And nice. Um, you know, I think it was that 
you probably know these episodes better than I do, but um, the George <laughs> Lucas one, uh, is that Raiders oh, yes. of the Lost Art? Is that something? No. What is that? Uh, crap. You know, it's the one yes. where we went back and we yes. dealt with like George Lucas and film school. And, um, and I should give credit. I believe that was Chris Fedex idea. And he's, he's a very geeky film guy, as, as am I. And the idea of like, what would happen if there was no Indiana Jones, all yeah. of a sudden, that's, that's a very personal story to me because you're like, well, I would not have made any of the choices I made in life if it weren't for Indiana Jones. And so again, you've got these silly low stakes that are very important to us. It also becomes like self-referential and, and, and sort of about pop culture. And um, that was the one episode where I remember coming into the room and somebody pitched it to me and they kind of looked at me like, he's not going to say yes, this is stupid. <laughs> he's he's going to like, you know, put us on the right course. And like, we are just like, no, this is fine. Go, go for it. And once we realized that like the bigger chances that we took with the show, it seemed like the more people started to respond and that it just... It became this sort of feedback yeah. loop that ultimately, you know, famously sort of reached its apex with the Bebo fight, which was, <laughs> sorry, is that the end of season two or season three? God, all they all season run together. Season three, yeah. It season ends. three, <laughs> yes, of course. So yeah, that was kind of the, you know, uh, the moment where, you know, that was us crossing the, the, the silliness Rubicon. There was just no going yeah. back. And at that point it became, you know, we realized like, oh God, people are talking about us, <laughs> you know, which is a <laughs> rare thing for yeah. any show because there's so many and it's certainly rare for network. And yeah, uh, it's very rare for shows that are kind of in their, their middle age. And, you know, that just became really thrilling because it seemed like the, the, the wackier we became, the more kind of critically acclaimed, you know, there was this strange paradox that the, yeah. the, sillier, the sillier we got, the smarter the people seemed to think that we were, so. True. <laughs> But I think this show and you guys like did it so well because you could do that kind of stuff and those kind of choices and everyone going like, ooh, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like this is not working. But for mm -hmm. some reason, that's what I always say when I like yeah, make my reactions or whatever. I'm like, I don't know how this show does it, but it just makes it work, even though yeah. it, like, it seems like the dumbest idea ever. Yeah. But yeah. for some reason, it just turns out brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I think to be silly, you have to have once been smart and then have made a conscious effort to yeah. set that aside. I mean, you could be brainy, you could be ponderous, you could, you know, hopefully we, you know, we do have big ideas that we're just too bashful to attack head on. And so, or especially with emotion, you know, for me, it's difficult to attack some of that stuff in an overt or earnest way because it just tell me if this is a Scandinavian thing I've always blamed it on my Scandinavian family that like there is a, you know you can't be um forward with with feelings or you know and so yeah I've always blamed my family it's a Scandinavian thing <laughs> so you you know you have to kind of sneak it in there or arrive at this earnest earnestness in a kind of roundabout way and you know I mean but thank you thank you for saying that that our show should be dumber than it is because like i mean we, we actually do work very hard and a lot yeah. of the things and i think it shows people, yeah like i've had people like literally ask me whether i break story sitting on a toilet and you're just like <laughs> like how insulting is that like if you were a <laughs> surgeon i wouldn't say like do you do surgery on a toilet like you're yeah. just like we actually you know spend an enormous amount of time talking in a very deep way about these characters and it's yeah. not it's not like a joke like yeah we bang our head I mean I, I talk about in the present tense which is so sad because this is all in the past now yeah but you know we used to bang our head trying to break the tiniest little details and um and yeah I mean the people who make the show care about it tremendously and 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 you know the people who we'd pass our scripts off to and th that would bring it to life you know that's a real responsibility because you yeah. know, I mean, they, they spend 14 hours a day out in the freezing rain just shooting these stories and like, yeah, yeah we, we have to do our best, you know? Yeah. And yeah. again, like, I think a, a, as we were making Legends, everybody involved had this recognition that like, we're never going to get the chance to do this again. Um, mm. We do have this incredibly, this serendipitous collection of like-minded, but also very disparate people who yeah. have, have found a way of making uh, a show that feels unique and creatively fulfilling for all of us. And like, you know, 
the huge middle chunk of the show was just, it was, it was a real, um, it was such a gift because we knew that we were going to keep doing it. And, and every time we did it, had the sensation that we're getting better at doing it. And that's, it's not always that way. Like if you do mm. something that's repetitive, you can get bored. Yeah. You can, you can fall back into old habits and it becomes just kind of reflexive. You're not really thinking about what you're doing. And I mean, that was the wonderful thing about legends is that it, it always kept everybody engaged because we were always doing something that we had not quite done before. So we had yeah, to learn, how, learn how to do it. You talked about like the people who were making the show. And that was like <laughs> one of my questions, like, how do you collect the people around you in the writer's room mm -hmm. or in the cast or like the guest stars or the directors or like anyone yeah. who comes and makes the show? Because it honestly, and again, we yeah. talked about this with many people when it's like, it just seems like everyone who has worked on the show loves it yeah and wants to talk about it and yeah. like you know love the process and you know all this so I'm like I don't know if it was easy like finding people did you have like a some kind of philosophy behind, a, a like, secret secret people? secret questionnaire <laughs> yeah. um, I, I wish I could I wish I could say that there was a deliberate kind of method for it but you know I will say there's a lot of luck And there's also a sort of critical mass. Like once once you amass a certain kind of energy, it sort of attracts like like energy. It, it's a funny thing. Again, we didn't. It wasn't always harmonious. And I, I guess the philosophy that that like I tried to adhere to was like let people stay as long as they'd like. You know, try to accommodate their wishes when they wish to leave. Let them leave. You know, Katie Lotz is the only person who from you know. Who can, well, yeah, not true. Amy Pemberton. <laughs> Amy, um, but yes. Well. Yeah. <laughs> so those people, um, you know, but most everybody else came and went or came and then came back. And, yeah. you know, so it's, it's a good thing to not hold people hostage. It's, you know, I mean, people like, you know, Maisie uh, Richardson Sellers, she wanted to go do something else. And like, of course. Yeah, you should do something else. You're wildly talented. You could do any number of things. Yeah, and uh, you know these people have to sign contracts that last for seven years, which is you know quite heavy. Yeah, and then same thing for writers uh, because you know people can come work on my show, but at a certain point they're going to want to do their own show, and I don't want somebody to have to stick around and feel like they're imprisoned. And then you know it's just became a funny thing. The actors truly love each other and somehow that energy affects us writers who also yeah. are very fond of each other. And, you know, yeah. this whole show is based on the notion of people caring for each other, even though they have no reason to be in any kind of quasi family. And so yeah. <laughs> it's the art limita imitating life and vice versa. And, you know, it's very hard to get something like that going, but once it's going, it powers itself. And then, mm. Mm, then it's it's simple. Then I you know I don't even need to do anything really. Yeah. I mean I could I could have quit this job like three years ago. The show would have been fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's good because it seriously it looks to outside like everyone is really enjoying yeah. it, which is amazing. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know if that's is. rare, but it for some rare. reason on it's this show rare. it's like it's just very obvious yeah so cool. you know and a lot of the crew have been together long before legends so that's the other mm. unsung, unsung hero you know our line producer uh val has i mean they go back to like fringe and you know so, i mean some of some of our crew members ha have been working together since the 80s um wow that's so and cool. <laughs> yeah so they're they're very very good yeah. and you know they also know each other and I think that's why we were able to pull off things on a relatively modest budget in a very restrictive time schedule that, yeah. you know, I don't think people normally attempt to do because it's impossible and they're just, they're so good. Our, our, our crew is amazing and yeah. it, they just never said no to anything. And we kept expecting them to say like, <laughs> this is stop time out. This is yeah. like, they're like, no, we can do it. Yeah. That's so good. Well, you kind of talked about like Maisie wanting to leave, for example, mm -hmm. to do other things and stuff like this. But yeah. then like one of my questions was like when you made the decisions of changing the character, but keeping the actor. Yeah. What was that process like? Was it the same with all of them? Like for same reasons? Like, do you run out of story for a character, but you want to keep the actor? Or what was it like with 
Maisie, for example, or Tala or Matt or these um, people who've played multiple characters. On yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it always boils down to us not wanting to lose an extremely talented actor. Yeah. And so sometimes the pressures were from within where we recognized, oh no, this performer's going to get tired or, oh God, we're going to run out of story. Or, you know, the Constantine thing was slightly different because the pressure in some way was from without, but that's right. <laughs> maybe best not to be getting, gotten into, but like yeah. with Maisie, I would say, I didn't know her when we cast her to be Amaya, who was a woman, you know, from the post-war era, yeah. a member of the JSA. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's not who Maisie is. Um, mm. And for her to play this very staid and kind of dutiful, I mean, she did a wonderful job of it, but, yeah. um, you know, with Tal as well, I mean, and you're just sort of curious because you've seen what they can do within the parameters of character. I, I guess that's really what it is. Selfishly, you're just, you just want to see like, what could they do if you just handed them something completely different? And, um, yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, like to have Constantine leave the show seemed devastating mm. until you put it in the context of like, oh God, what if Matt Ryan left the show? And then all of a sudden yeah. you're like, well, that's he way doesn't worse. have to. <laughs> he doesn't have to, and then and then it's it's kind of wonderful because you're like Matt played Constantine long before I met him, so yeah, a lot of a lot of those choices were made. But coming up with Gwyn meant that we got to discover a character, and you know, discovering a character is I guess it's sort of like falling in love because you know at first they're an abstraction, you know, because you create a character on paper and then you meet the performer. And, you know, and, but, but as the performer performs the character, you get to know the character. And so your writing becomes sharpened and their performances become, it's again, it's one of these feedback loops, sort of like what I was talking about yeah. when it comes to the, you know, esprit de corps or whatever. But, you know, that also exists with performers. And um, at a certain point, you could just hear their voice in your head because they've made that character so indelible, you mm -hmm. know, and, and utterly unique because, you know, that's, that's who those performers are. And like, I, you know, I told the story once before, but like when Matt Ryan was playing Gwyn, the one time I was up on set and, and I spent time with him, like, I know who Matt Ryan is. And when he was Constantine, I had one relationship with him, but like, yeah. I felt like I had a different relationship when he was Gwyn because he seemed like a different person to me. Yeah. And I felt like I'd lost the closeness like that I had. But yeah. then I told the story once before, but like when we did the flashback scene in World War One, and he had to shave his beard off to be with the mustache in the flashback. Yeah. As soon as he shaved the beard off, I kind of reverted to like my original relationship with him. And he started <laughs> acting like the original Matt Ryan. And I think he had been like holding on to Gwyn's, oh, you know, all of Gwyn's energy. Mm. And it in was so beard. funny. In the beard. It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so good but I love especially with Matt how different and I've talked about this with Matt when it's like it, the characters are like in some ways like opposites but at the same mm. time very like there's some like really similar qualities about them he's amazing <laughs> yeah we wanted to make sure that he didn't get confused because in our minds yeah. we're like oh God, he's going to come back on set and he's going to be like, where's my trench coat? Where's my cigarette? Yeah. Let's go. And so <laughs> we did want to like have an exorcism for Constantine and make sure that he would never even flit across his imagination. And so it was great yeah. because we, we get to talk about whales and the great war and poets and uh you know i mean constantine does talk about god but it, you know uh, gwyn is in a, a very different way <laughs> is a pious man as opposed yes. to a hellraiser yeah 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 are there episodes or moments in the show that turned out better than you thought like when you mm. were writing it or breaking it down or whatever and then you saw it happen and you were like oh <laughs> This was not what we thought, but this is better. <laughs> or in any other way, like different than what you had planned or vision. Hmm. I mean, the Bebo fight, certainly, because, you know, <laughs> we had nothing to do with it. It was the last episode and we just took all the money what that was left over and said, like, please spend it. 
Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> there was no promise that it would turn out well. I will say that the, the episodes in Sarajevo at the end of last season, like they still make my head hurt. I don't know if I fully understand them. Like the <laughs> certain things like, you know, the bar, the fixed point and looking at the kind of the old print of the events that would sort of change. Yeah. Like, I don't know, there have been episodes where you go into them and you're like, I don't know if this is going to work. Like, and there, you know, there's also the, the premiere of, is it four or five? Rasputin, that must be season five, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, it is. I think so. We're doing the reality um, conceit and, you know, our director, Kevin Mock, who had worked in reality at a certain point, like very close to like production, had this moment of being like, oh, but reality looks terrible. And, you know, <laughs> wh why are we going to spend all these millions of dollars to have something look terrible? And you're like, oh, God, have we made like a horrible mistake? Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it didn't turn out that way. And yeah, I mean, there's never been an episode where you're just like, that was an unmitigated disaster. I'll never do it again. That's I good. mean, at the very least, you learn something or you find something delightful about it. I mean, things are hard, things are very hard sometimes. You know, like doing the animation. Mm. The, yeah. Again, we're just, we're just sort of ignorant and audacious and set out to do things that people shouldn't try for good reason. And we just assume like, oh, people don't try this because they're not as clever as we are. And that's yeah. not the truth. They're just, <laughs> we're, we're stupid. And like th things like animation, after you do it, you're like, oh, I, I, I understand. It turns out this is extremely complicated. And we just assumed with our like, how complicated can it be? And the answer is like, <laughs> very Very. more complicated than we imagine um <laughs> what things yeah is there anything in particular you, you're you're thinking about i don't know if i have a specific thing in mind i just think there's so much crazy stuff that i can't even imagine what it would have set in the script or like you know like <laughs> <laughs> like reading their script and being like wait what is this like <laughs> I, one of my favorite things I remember be just watching uh -huh. like what the heck is going on is uh -huh. like when Mick's alien babies are like eating Bishop mm -hmm. and then there's like all of that stuff in that like whole episode and sequence with the mushrooms and the aliens mm -hmm. and there's just I don't know like so much like <laughs> such weird stuff that it, again it works but like <laughs> I was like, I don't know, like who comes up with this stuff and how does it work as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mushrooms could have gone terribly wrong. <laughs> it could have. And with the animation and like so many things. Yeah. And then like, let's do a whole season about aliens. Yeah. But it is all just great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when, I think you guys were doing some kind of like panel and you were talking about season mm -hmm. seven and saying mm -hmm. that Gideon will be mm -hmm. there in like human form for example and then that the team is going to be stuck in the 20s mm -hmm. and all yeah. of that and I, again yeah. at that point I'm like that sounds I don't, stupid I don't get it or like, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like it doesn't sound good or in a way it does in a way I was like oh this is exciting it's going to be different yeah. but in my opinion season yeah. seven is the best one because it's so I think different. so too I think so too uh, yeah, if I had to do it over again, I just would have left them on that road trip forever, just w yeah. wandering across America. I really, <laughs> I, I, I knew that we had to resolve uh, the stories, but that trip could have lasted forever for me. I really, yeah. I did enjoy it. And I really enjoyed the camaraderie that Liv and Amy and Liz, you know, yeah. all, all are relatively new performers. The fact that, uh, you know, in the midst of a pandemic with, you know, three expats stuck in Canada together. Uh, the fact that they, they really, the energy that they had was yeah. just so irrepressible. Mm -hmm. um, it was so delightful. Yeah. yeah. And cause it's obvious that they had that in real life. Yeah. And then we could see it in the show happening at the same time, like them actually becoming like really good yeah. friends. And I was like, this is the best. <laughs> it is the best. Okay. I'm going to go back to the questions because this okay. is, otherwise this is going <laughs> to. That's fine. <laughs> this is never going to end. What's the hardest decision you have to make as a showrunner? Are there hard decisions that you have to yeah, make? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. There are definitely, there are definitely hard decisions. I mean, mostly it's just a thousand sort of easy decisions and it's more the kind of 
cumulative sort of fatigue that you get from just having to decide a million little things. But yet there, there, there are the big things. Like having to write a character off is really, it's super heavy because yeah. in some sense you're like, no, never. We love all these characters. But then understanding that the show has to change in order to grow, um, you know, that's the bittersweetness because like if things are working, there's also easy justification to say, don't change anything. Just keep, keep yeah. repeating. That's the bittersweetness. You know that it can't last, but then at the same time, even painful separations and changes can lead to, to new discoveries. And yeah, having done the show for long enough, you can at least take faith and like, okay, we've done this before. I mean, the most difficult things that I've done haven't been related to the creative because Warner Brothers, our, our studio and the CWR network were both extremely supportive uh, as testament to you and the fans. Like we've yeah. always felt like so much support. And, you know, at a certain point, we know how to do this. Like, again, there's moments where you're like, I mean, as a writer, there's you, every episode you feel like it's never going to break. This is the yeah. episode. It's just, we'll never figure it out. But, you know, yeah. after you've done that 110 times, you're like, you know, it's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you have cuts that come in that feel like they're horrible, the end of the world. And it always works out. You always find solutions. But I will say during the pandemic, when our crew had all relocated to Canada and it was the early summer and it was, you know, 2020, the beginning of season six, and it was unclear whether we were going to be able to, to make the show. And I remember we had these Zooms with all the actors and they were just, they were so scared and confused and they were looking to me for answers that I just didn't have. Right. And I, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable giving creative answers or at least bullshitting my way through them. I do that with actors my whole life. I've you yeah. know, gotten quite proficient. But yeah. when people are talking about like public health and a pandemic and their careers and their families and being separated from loved ones and, uh, you know, we had unions and we had uh, border restrictions and, you know, these actors had, had to do a two week quarantine every time they arrived in Canada which meant that they could also not leave Canada. Um, and, you know, those were the sort of moments where, you know, I think everybody was saying like, I didn't sign up for this, you know? And the fact that we were able to create TV at that time became a, a really wonderful distraction for ourselves and hopefully one that <laughs> became a distraction for the world. Yeah. We had writers who didn't leave their homes for a solid year here in Los Angeles. And for people who live alone to not see a human being for a year yeah, is, crazy. is immensely debil debilitating. And, you know, I mean, the people making this show, it's arduous enough under optimal circumstances, but to do it with a mask on or a swab yeah. up your nose or to worry whether you're going to get sick and die or whether you're, the production's going to get shut down and everybody's going to lose their job. And, you know, nobody knew what was going on. So like that, that was by far the the hardest thing I've ever lived through and hopefully that'll be it yeah <laughs> yeah I don't know if it can get worse than that I hope not but yeah I yeah. don't know I don't yeah. know <laughs> but again what a great season like came out of that yeah. so yeah. yeah it's funny I mean I think the impulse between doing kind of like trashy b-movie Aliens was just like, <laughs> we were looking to do the opposite of what the world, you know, the direction the world seemed to be headed in. We wanted to yeah. do something that was so unmoored from reality that we didn't have to think about how awful the world was. We wanted to think about like slimy aliens who exploded or <laughs> whatever, whatever yeah, else. Exactly. They, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good distraction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you talked about like having to write characters off and stuff mm -hmm. but do you mm -hmm. have favorite like character introductions like writing characters in like introducing yeah. new characters I mean I really like Gary's introduction because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know he was really not supposed to figure in as anything other than Ava's assistant dramatically his only function was to you know somebody needed parking validation he was supposed to put some <laughs> stickers on a parking ticket and <laughs> I love the, the oh, character yeah. whose function was to put stickers on a parking ticket could later become like the linchpin for an entire season mm -hmm. um or that you know I think one of the questions was did did we 
consider him to be an alien when he came on the show? And yeah. no, no, of course not. <laughs> not. Of course not. He was just, a, I mean, originally he was supposed to be from Miami. He was just a nice <laughs> Jewish boy from Miami whose dad was an orthodontist and his mom was slightly overbearing. I, I believe this was the original backstory. It was very <laughs> banal <laughs> because, well, you know, he just worked at the Time Bureau. With, it's like a government bureaucracy. It was supposed to be in, super boring. And yeah. <laughs> Uh, but then once Ava became a clone, you're like, ooh, she's got a juicy backstory. And mm -hmm. oh my God, they've got all these magical creatures in their basement. And we're like, we don't want to make, we got to give Gary something juicy. And then when it came to season six, we didn't want Katie to be kidnapped by herself because she would have no some, nobody to talk to. But at the same time, you don't want her to be kidnapped with somebody formidable because then she'd have a partner, but so you're yeah. like, who's the least formidable person? <laughs> but then you're like, we don't want to make Gary a boob because we, we, we've <laughs> obviously, we made him a boob in the past. So yeah. you're like, how could you make him secretly formidable? And then you're just like, ah, well, we'll give him an alien backstory. Then he's the expert. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, we have this habit of characters who only reveal things like seasons later when they like, oh, did I never mention like, of course, I know everything about aliens because I was once <laughs> in, in, engaged to Kayla and uh, yeah. <laughs> oh God. Oh, and what a yeah. moment. I did not see that coming at all. Like <laughs> I remember when it was revealed and there was the freaking cocoon or whatever like yeah. in his room. Yeah. And then yeah. we get back to like him and Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> and, like what? <laughs> I was like, what the? And then you stop and you think for a second and you're like, this makes perfect sense. Good way. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I enjoyed, I enjoyed how the stunt performer who played Alien Gary was mm. so good at picking up Adam's energy <laughs> and his mannerisms. Yeah. I was like, yeah. are we sure it's not Adam in that suit? But I guess, no. <laughs> he would have gladly done it. He would have gladly <laughs> yeah. put on the suit. Yeah. Was it always the same guy? Like it was yes. the same Alien Gary? Same aliens for Kayla and for Alien Gary amazing yeah um i think oh god i don't want to get this wrong i think gorilla grod was alien kayla at a bunch of the other um stunt performances that were very very nuanced i hope i'm saying i hope i'm not confusing two stunt performers that's cool yeah <laughs> stunt team is just i would love to talk to someone from there because i just think oh like oh i'm sure we can make that happen I, I think it would be so cool because there's so much happening in this show that wouldn't be able to happen or wouldn't look as good as it does without them. It would be so cool. Yeah, to, yeah. Like, well, it's, of, yeah. It's, it's, fu it's fun that they get to work on stunts that like aren't entirely heroic. Like I have to say the um, Zari, Robo Zari slap fight in what is that? Oh, episode God. 14. It's just like when it just goes into slow-mo and it starts playing the kind of Carmina Burana sort of esque music. I just, yeah. I, God, I love it so much. And and God, some of the 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 comedic stunts that Katie did in the Sarajevo episode with just her like getting the poison in the face or doing yeah. the Pratt falls. It's just like, oh, it's just so genius. I love, I love it. Oh so yeah. good, that's <laughs> such a good episode. That was Macy's episode, right? It was Macy's. Yeah, followed by Jess's. Those, yeah, those, yeah. Mm -hmm. how do you decide that was one of the questions I'm just mm -hmm. like jumping from like wherever yeah. we're going sure. how do you decide who di directs each episode because you have yeah. some directors who come back and then some of the cast direct mm -hmm. them how do you like how do you decide who directs which episode and well normally you have to decide that way before you decide what the episodes are so more oh. often it is us pairing the episode to the kind of aesthetic of the director. You know, for instance, we knew Andrew Cash was gonna do the zombie episode in five. Um, mm -hmm. And he's, a, he's, he's into very, oh, oh yes. <laughs> that I was one. waiting for um, it, anyways. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah. We knew what he was into. And so we try to tailor the episode and like Katie's, first episode I believe was the Genghis Khan one and we're just like well Katie is so adept at doing stunts like let's give her a 90s John Woo action thing yeah 
Um, and, you know, my only regret is that we didn't give Jess, she really wanted to do like a dance mm. uh, based episode. And I know we did the Bullet Blondes dance, which she would have been, she wanted that episode so bad. And I suppose I screwed up. Um, <laughs> But, I, you know, she, both she and Katie are obviously really good dancers. So I, yeah. I, I wish they had been able to give Jess like a, a full musical. Mm. But um, yeah. Ah. Yep. Uh, a musical episode. I know. I know. They have been talking about some of that in like some interviews where they were like, we should have done like a full on like a burlesque number with all mm-hmm. the. I know. I was like, well. I know. I know. We would have gotten to it eventually, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure too. A lot of people were asking about like if the show mm. would have another season, if there would be more, or I don't know if it makes sense to say anything. You don't have to say anything. Yeah, like what what if but, we get to do it? And I've already like burned yeah, through the idea. True. Yeah. You don't have to, but is there like mm. a lot of stuff that you guys were like, oh, we were ready to go for the next season and the next one we had the ideas like ready for everything? Or was it like Oh, we're canceled. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we would always create like a roadmap at the start of the season. And then gradually we would start to deviate from the roadmap. And by the time we got to the end, we would realize that it was a vague blue blueprint because, you know, all those little decisions you make along the way have an effect later on. But we certainly had a blueprint for where we wanted it to go. And we knew what we wanted to do with certain characters. And, you know, every episode we kind of have a, a big bad and usually they're kind of a, a stand-in for some kind of a, a real life villain that we're you know um you know we've taken on technology with the loom of faith we have our social issues that are kind of you know i mean i guess the alien issue is kind of about ecology or you know uh you know the idea that the earth is a sensitive organism that's interconnected and that we, we need to care for. You know, again, it's yeah. we're not overt with our politics, but I think yeah. season eight, we were going to we were going to take on capitalism a little bit um, and uh, corporate right. greed and the idea that the timeline, like everything else or history, had become polluted by forces of market forces and evil corporations and yeah. look i mean it you know we also are aware that we are a corporate pro- product we're not trying tr- <laughs> tr- trying to we're bite the head of it, it. but yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you know um i think i think we were interested you know with the idea of fixed points you know we talked about time fascists and i think we're going to sort of follow that idea and you know, perhaps imagine that the wealthy elite got to enjoy the sort of time travel experience. And we wanted to imagine like, what if it became a corporate product? You know, the same way that going to space right now is something you can only do if you're a uh, jerk uh, CEO. (laughs) (laughs) So that was going to be our soapbox, I think. (laughs) Yeah. And then I think we were also, I wanted to do like a 60s or 70s kind of new age Los Angeles kind of spiritual cult. Yeah. Not not like the Manson family, like a, 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 b- a beneficent kind of spirituality based cult like in, and, and we really wanted to put like Zari into that world. Yeah. I wanted a lot, of, a lot of people to be barefoot and I wanted people to kind of come up with like a groovy means of time travel where instead of using technology they come up with like a, a metaphysical means of like, I wanted to get into some real hippy dippy shit. So. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, it was a very hippie, hippie season down on capitalism, free love. Nobody wears shoes. It, yeah. yeah, it's going to be, it would have been great. Uh, oh man. Do you have favorite, like you kind of tapped into it now. Do you have favorite villain slash seasons with the, villain story or like are they all just great (laughs) i mean it is hard not to love neil mcdonough it's hard not to love casper crump yeah um you know these people are just so much fun they're so (laughs) much fun i mean as far as villains go god i have to i have to actively think about like who was our villain who was yeah 
<laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, every season had like a villain, and then the whole season was kind of based on that. Or like in my head, that's like how yeah. it went. Yeah. And then Bishop kind of came back in season. Bishop. <laughs> oh my God. Bishop was so much fun. He was yeah. He was my favorite. I was like, he was he was the best. He was the best. I know. I know. And it was so amazing. I mean, back to the pandemic, which I should stop talking about, but like <laughs> The idea that we really wanted to limit our bubble size and that, so we just were able to hire people's significant others, you know, yes. so that we got Jess's husband, Nick, and you yes. know, we got Adam's for three different girlfriend episodes. for three different bad guys. Yeah. I mean, they were, just, so they, were, they were all, yeah. Yeah. The fact that Tala and Rafi are married to each other, it's uh, Rafi, it's, it's crazy that like, mm -hmm. How could that much talent exist under one roof? Yeah. Was it? Well, I guess because of the pandemic, it was an intentional yeah. thing to do that and have the people um, who are already quarantining with them at home yeah. to have like everyone come on the show. But <laughs> yeah. it was so cool. Again, I was like, I don't know what other show could do this. Yeah. And just be like, yeah. Nick is in three different episodes playing three different guys and Ooh, yeah <laughs> I know a lot of times people just pretend that there are rules and the, you know maybe no. no I exactly I mean like Shakespeare and drama didn't have women and Greek drama only had what like four actors and people would just change masks and yeah yeah I mean True. people's imaginations are infinitely powerful at at, uh, at accommodating. That is the thing. I do think you could make a Legends. I feel like if we had like one day to break a story, one day to shoot a story, one day to edit the story, and then we had to air something, it, it might be a pretty good show. Like, <laughs> I, you know, I, Honestly, you know yeah. it's too bad that we, we, we didn't get picked up for presumably market reasons, but like you could kind of make the show for any amount of time, any amount of money, just all you need is the group of people to get yeah. together and to be in a room. And like, yeah, I mean, that's why we did so many sitcoms because we're just like, or reality shows or, or you know, puppets. Yeah. Oh, God. It, it actually doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter, it, you know. Well, some of the fan questions, which I love mm. that people were asking about like different characters, because often it's like pretty much the same question. But yeah. um, one of the questions that came up a couple of times was about Spooner and uh -huh. her coming out and that uh -huh. whole story. How did that come about? And if you can talk about that. Sure. Journey for her. Yeah, I mean, it was very late in the process. We were already in the episode. We were already breaking the story. But it's one of those things that like, when it is pitched, and forgive me that I can't remember which of the writers pitched it, it just makes sense. And it, it does make you wonder, like, have we been like working towards this subconsciously? Yeah. And, yeah. and not like really knowing, um, because as soon as, as soon as you hear it, it, it makes sense moving, going backwards. Mm -hmm. And then of course you share it with, you know, Lisette, the performer, and you have a moment of being like, oh God, like what if she, what if she doesn't like what well, and then it makes perfect sense to her as well. It's funny, like, I think we, we, we would always get credit from the studio and network at when we would turn in a finale and they would kind of always shake their heads and they would just be like, I don't know how you did it, but you, you landed the airplane. Like it was, it did yeah. not, it was not pretty. It was coming down and it was on fire and somehow <laughs> you guys <laughs> brought it in for a landing. Yeah. And I feel like, I do feel like there is an improvisational aspect to, to telling a long form, form story. Do you know the, I, I didn't know this before I did Legends, but the term uh, retconning, retroactive continuity, it's like a comic book thing. I oh, believe no, it's I often, it, it's used as like a dirty word to explain like retroactively continuity, explaining something. I don't know if it's always like pejorative, but in my mind, it doesn't have to be a bad thing if you can, yeah make something make sense working backwards. I do, I do feel like there are seeds being planted all the time that you might not notice until you stop and, and look backwards. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I do feel like if you tell a story and you're confined by preconceptions that you had when you started to tell the story, I mean, the danger is, it's again, it's the difference between a symphony and, and jazz, you know, 
Um, if you yeah. want to hear a beautiful, perfectly executed, perfectly composed symphony, you know, that's never going to be legends. No. But <laughs> if you want to hear a jazz improvisation with some very gifted players, um, yeah, we're here. Hopefully. Reform <laughs> jazz. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Isn't that what Sarah says? <laughs> it's, well, I mean, that's kind of one of the catchphrases we have from the room. That one goes back to when I worked on a show called Chuck, my friend Matt Miller oh. would, would always call, talk, talk about freeform jazz. And so- I love that. Oh, thank you. That's when we allowed ourselves to just change up the time signature, change up the key, yeah, yeah. you know, just see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, such a good show. Thanks. Uh, yeah. What about, uh, one question was about, I think V was asking about mm. Bayrod and how was he always planned to stay on the team as a regular after season five and him because like him joining the show uh -huh. was like very random but again yes. it worked so well or like it was like watching it is like what the heck is happening <laughs> but at yeah. the same time again it just yeah made sense and now he <laughs> B. You know? yeah that was that was scary because when you're breaking a finale, you've run out of time and you're having to wrap everything up. And again, the beginning of a season, it's very deliberate, brick by brick. By the end, you're just like, ah, running around. <laughs> it's so crazy. And so, I mean, that was one of the most crazy finales, that Hay World thing. Uh, you know, we had so much to do. We had a James Taylor sing along. We had oh, Nick. Oh gosh, yes. We had to change history. Uh, it was very complicated. And then we had to have this actor just like magically appear in like the last 10 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And like the scary thing is, we knew we were going to be obliged to keep that actor the following season. And so we, we had the audition for Barad, and I was totally, you know, distracted and stressed out. And I believe it was, it was Grania Godfrey, uh, one of our writers. Yeah. I guess we were casting in person back then at the end of season five. And, you know, I looked at everybody's tape and I'm just like, oh, they're, they're all good. I, I don't know. And she's just like this guy. And I was just like, what? Okay, shy, I guess. Here's his headshot. Yeah. And so like at a certain point, I was just like, okay, Grania, it, this totally, it's on you. Yeah. <laughs> and then you meet this guy and you're like, he, of course, like how could it be anybody other than him? You know, mm -hmm. it's- He is these, <laughs> He is Bayrod. And just, yeah. you know, Amy Pemberton was a voice actor that we randomly hired before seeing her face or hearing her sing or watching her dance or all these things. And it's like, you know, you're like shy, can you play guitar? He's like, oh yeah, not only can I play guitar, I'm going to, like, he played that like live. Like normally you go into like a sound booth right. and you, you re-record and you mix it and you auto-tune it and, you know, you have somebody else do all the hard stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just like did all those performances like live and you're like, uh, like, I don't, how did we, how did we, we don't deserve you. <laughs> <laughs> You're too good for us. You're too good. Go, <laughs> go, do something else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love it. And that's like, again, there is something about this show that I feel like just things like this just happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess that's probably why I was drawn to the idea of doing a, a cult story, because at a certain point, I did feel like we, <laughs> there were aspects of a communal kind of, it started to feel like, yeah, you're like, ooh, there's something going on. <laughs> so there's a, there's a magic. Like, uh, you. <laughs> the legend's cold. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you mentioned Amy a little bit. Yeah. How, how did it come about bringing her onto the screen? Because she was in a few times and mm -hmm. then at, like season seven, she was there which mm -hmm. was fantastic. I think it was one of the best ideas for this show. Like at that point, I was like, that's genius. Oh. She's always been there and now it makes so much sense and it's <laughs> so much fun to see her on the screen, so. Oh, thanks. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. I just, uh, I, was, I was listing off all of the kind of paranoias and uh, yeah. uh, sort of anxieties we have for society. And yeah, so, I mean, season seven was artificial intelligence and yeah, again, we, we've, 
I guess I'm scared of technology. And so we're kind of doing sort of what we did talking about the loom and social media kind of controlling your life sort of thing. But yeah, it was that story of man versus machine or woman versus machine. Mm. And, you know, just trying to understand like what humans have that can't be duplicated by, by technology. Yeah. So the idea of the legends having to exist without, without all of the things that made their, their lives so easy and having to depend on old fashioned things and having to depend on one another. I guess that's the paradox of the show is because, you know, we spent so many seasons trying to shock people by expanding the show or doing things that were outrageous. And then you realize that you can't do that forever. At a certain yeah. point, people are, are going to catch on there's a pattern here. You, you're just doing the same thing with more kind of bells and whistles. Mm. And so we really wanted to simplify this show and to take away Gideon, you know, it's like not having Google in your life. You know, you drive differently. You listen to different music. I don't know. I would contend you live a better life with the less, the less technology you have in it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, I guess, dear, that, that we wanted that return to kind of simplicity for our team and uh, to prove that humans have a capacity that can't be reproduced. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we're all out of a job. Yeah, and it was amazing to see her because it's like, it is the same character. It is still Gideon, but mm-hmm. it's completely different. Of course, it's her, but at the same time, it's yeah. very different. Yeah, I mean, when we did the 100th episode and we had human Gideon going through her own memories, you know, with her companions, we did want to lean into the idea that she had been a part of the team, but she had been neglected. The team had taken her for granted. And sure, she's not human, but we wanted to kind of get that longing of you know, those moments where she would go back and see the memories that, that you know, were never on the TV show, like that yeah. moment when, when she was talking to, to Ava about, yeah. you know, her, her kidnapped um, fiance. Yeah. And to realize like she was there as a friend and, you know, she gave as a human, but never was accepted as a human. And, you know, I mean, a lot of our stories come down to that. I mean, so much of Gary's story was about being taken for granted, or, yeah. you know, it was about the legends who have this philosophy about accepting everybody. But then, you know, every club is exclusionary. At a certain point, you know, even the indie kids, they turn into the mean kids in a, in a way. And yeah. they, they kept him at arm's length and didn't recognize him fully as a friend and member of their team. And, you know, when he had a relationship with Gideon, they had a very kind of dismissive sort of attitude to the fact yeah. that they could be in love or have sex or, and that's not fair. You know, no. it's, it's, it's the, there should be, uh, you know, again, there's a nominal captain of the wave rider and every team, I guess, has a maybe mother, father, both, you know, there's a head of a household, but like, you know, it, we didn't, never wanted it to be like hierarchical. And that's what we, you know, season seven was kind of breaking down all the things that the legends thought they were good at to watch Jess <laughs> and Sarah um, have these moments of doubt. And doubt doesn't have to be weakness or to put other people in charge. Because again, the, the other team are the uh, de facto children, but children grow and children eventually supplant their parents and parents yeah. learn from their children and all this stuff. And so yeah. like, we do want to like have it be a family, but allow the family to, to grow. And this recording says I have less than a minute. So I'm going to wrap up this question and yep. I, can, I, I can also wait for another um, link. We can wrap and, this up in the next and then, you know. Okay. Be done. As you, <laughs> I can, okay. See it a little bit. I think we'll do only like a couple more questions and then we can be done. So Sounds it's good. not. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. You need to go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, I need to sleep. <laughs> there was a couple like really good ones that I liked from the fans. Uh-huh. Now that we started this, like rewatching the show from season one. So we do like two uh-huh. episodes a week and then I oh, yeah. live and then people join the live to talk about the episodes and like what they thought and what they did oh, yeah? remember about, you know, going back to season one and stuff. Oh yeah. Wh- where are you now? Which episode are you up to? We're- this week we're talking about episodes 11 and 12. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, I'm sorry that I don't have social media. I, I'm sorry <laughs> that I can't, I can't follow all you guys. I feel like. <laughs> That's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. 
Like you said earlier, maybe you're better off. But anyway, <laughs> I thought I would inform you that this is what we're doing. It's very fun to go back to the beginning. But yeah. since we are now in the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. this question from Eden I thought was great. I don't know uh -huh. if you have an answer for this, but I just thought the question was great. When okay. she was like, since Rip's family dying Whoa. seems to be a fixed point, who would be the fixer for this event? I just think that's great. <laughs> I mean, I suppose I'd like to say that I don't think that Rip's family's really dead. I mean, that seems too sad. There must be. It is there... very sad. Yeah, I don't, I feel like I don't want that to be true. So whether it's a fixed point or not, I, I don't think that that would have persisted. But that's yeah. a good idea. Who would have been that fixer? Yeah. What did, yeah, I don't know. I don't like them. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I just thought that was a good question. I was like, oh, that's, that is a good question. That's a cool thing to think about, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, because again, uh, yeah. a few questions about the campaign to save the legends. Again, yeah. you're not on social media, so I don't know okay. if the word has reached you or, at all or what people in the fandom have been doing, like trying to get the show. Yeah, I went, I went to try to see the airplane. I, I heard there was oh, an really? airplane. Yeah, I went to try to see that. And I've, I've been sent pictures of the various billboards. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, Cause there was a lot of questions about that. I don't know what my one question would be mm. if there's something that fans can do. Cause I, I feel like we don't know how any of this stuff works. I don't know how it works either. I don't, okay. know if, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody does. So that's okay. Yeah. It just happens. Think, it just happens. Yeah. Yeah. But the um, thing I've realized about life is you always assume that there's somebody who understands something better than you, but, there is. Um, but I don't think there is. I honestly, I think if you were to go into the White House or the G7 summit or the <laughs> yeah. whatever halls of power that you think like, I just a bunch of people trying to kind of do the best they can. And, yeah. But, you know, um, I think we all wish that there were some high and mighty super intelligence out there, but there's not. It's just people doing their jobs, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Well, someone was asking if there was some kind of thing that would still happen, do you have a format that you would picture that would be fun? They were mm. saying like, if it's like a movie or mm. comic book or uh, whatever <laughs> well I mean comic books are cheap uh, I don't do I don't do comic books but it seems yeah. like the, the threshold to do a comic book is quite low yeah uh, movies uh, it, it's the opposite it's quite high and that's like a little intimidating to me the idea that you'd have like one shot to wrap something up properly yeah it's kind of a lot of pressure it's not like I would say no to it but at the same time it's hard to imagine that actually working successfully. I mean, the truth is working in TV for a reason. I love yeah. getting to re reiterate. I love getting to explore. Yeah, so I prefer for it to be television. I mean, it doesn't have to be network te television. It doesn't yeah. have to be a one hour series. Um, if I had my choice, it would be great. I do, you know, it's always would be fun to try something a little bit new. So yeah, I mean, Sure, a streaming or cable version of Legends would be interesting because we would be able to do things that we weren't able to do with the, the first incarnation of the show. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll do whatever. I don't care. I just <laughs> like telling stories. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll keep hoping. Yeah. Just a couple of final questions about like uh -huh. favorite things. Do you have uh -huh. favorite moments like behind the scenes, like in the writer's room or on set or may favorite memories of working on Legends? Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite memories was after season four, we would always do like a, a trip to Las Vegas or we did a trip to Disneyland um, after season four. And nice. <laughs> we actually found out that we got season five, like as we were like at Disneyland. And so it was like raining like crazy. And <laughs> we were all like, you know, getting drunk at Disneyland or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and then we found out we had a new season. And, it, you know, I mean, that is that's amazing. That's pretty cool. I do miss the rap parties. Like it was so fun to just get up to Canada and see the cast and crew. You know, it is also fun to watch people get excited about a guest star. Like when Tom Wilson was on the show 
or when Cisco came and, yes. you know, to watch like actors act like dorky fans with, yeah. and, with their doing their selfies. And like, I love that. I mean, moments on the show. I mean, I, I really love the singing cowboy in, um, in season six. Yes. Um, I really, oh, that was so good. the sandworm. Yeah. I think one of the questions was, are there people who you wanted on the show that you couldn't get on the show? Mm, yeah, true. And yeah. yes, I, I had an extensive list of people who had said no to us and I jokingly called it our enemies list. Um, <laughs> and I hate to tell you the top of the enemies list was the most famous band out of Sweden. ABBA. Um, was they didn't the want to do this show. <laughs> well, yeah, we thought we, we thought we were going to be able to do an episode about Waterloo and the idea that the song had gotten to Napoleon and, you know, he had changed his his tactics uh, and it had changed the course of history. Amazing. Um, but we could not. And so that's why the Here I Go Again, the time loop episode. Yeah. So that's good. why they're dressed like ABBA and they're constantly you know, referencing things that yeah. happened off screen is because we couldn't, we couldn't do that. We couldn't use Ava, we couldn't use their music. And I think the singing cowboy, I originally wanted to be Sarah McLaughlin because I figured like, I don't know many Canadian <laughs> cow people. Cow so people. I, I could get the cowboy junkie because again, the borders were closed at the time. So they had yeah. to be in Canada. Yeah. So I was like, God, is Rufus Wainwright <laughs> he's Canadian, right? I think. I don't know. Is so I was just trying to think like who's a Canadian cowboy or girl. Yeah. Um, and for a second, I was really wanted it to be Sarah McLaughlin because she sang that super sad cowgirl song in Toys 2. Like, do you remember the song When She Loved Me? I think it's called. It's just oh, such a heartbreaker. But we couldn't get a famous cowboy or girl. And so we got that guy and he was <laughs> name's Daryl I believe and he, yeah. he plays in he plays in like a punk Irish band and he was amazing <laughs> and I love those songs um Matt Mala one of the writers wrote those tunes and they were so delightful and our our composer Daniel set them to music and yeah. I just I just I love that that musical montage just at the end of that episode is yeah. is just perfect when he's on the wave rider scene <laughs> just like what you're doing <laughs> yeah do you have favorite or moments in the show that you're the most proud of that now looking back you're like i'm so proud that hmm. i was part of making this show because of we had i mean th there are moments like that last shot on the wave rider in the hundredth episode yeah when it just is doing that tracking shot and it just sort of reminds you of all the people that have been a part of the show. And for me personally, it was really sweet to have everybody back and to just, you know, recognize their contribution for some of the people like Arthur, who, you know, was given a very heavy storyline and to give, to give him a chance to participate in the levity of the show. Yeah. I thought that was an, a nice homecoming that sort of reflected back on the show and kind of just marked its evolution through the through the years. So like, I don't know. I mean, that shot, it's pretty heartwarming. It is. People yeah. cried. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we're like done pretty well with all the questions and this has been okay. amazing. And oh, thank, thank you for talking to me. No, thank you. This was, I've done lives with like some people from the cast and then like Daniel, you just mentioned him. I've yeah. done a live with him. And then I just did one with Glenn Winter, uh -huh. which was mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. And when I posted that I'm doing like a chat with you, everyone was like, what the, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> how did know. This, this is so cool. So oh, good. I'm this trying is very, to... very exciting for me. Um, oh, good. I'm trying to really cultivate sort of a reputation for being a total recluse <laughs> weirdo no but thank you thank you for thank you for letting me talk to you and your community of fans and to yeah. you know ex express my gratitude and love to you guys and you know it's lonely work making tv mm. um especially in isolation and it's really nice to be reminded that the episodes actually reach an audience because yes. 
it's it's weird you know a lot of the work that we do it starts to feel very theoretical because oh whatever season we did when we had like completed the entire season almost before we had aired a single episode it, it starts to feel very yeah um, yeah and so it's nice to be reminded that there's actual human beings out there there is actual human beings and human <laughs> beings who really care about this show i only started making my videos at the beginning of season six so during uh -huh. like covid yeah um and it's just been so nice to now like meet people and talk to other fans and people who just like love this show so much and one of the things that i always say is like one of my favorite things about the show is how you guys somehow uh -huh. make it feel like we're a part of it as well <laughs> you know yeah and yeah it, it feels like like you guys are such a community and then in some ways even though we're not there and we're not yeah like involved in any way but in some ways it feels like we are yeah. which is yeah um very cool and we're yeah. like very grateful to you and to everyone who is making this show and well yeah we're all we're all kindred spirits and yeah again it's just it is another one of those like feedback loops that um yeah oh one of the questions was about a legends con i don't know what a legends oh, con is true. but to answer your question sure yes true. I would go to lisa was asking that um, what is that? But yes, so, I'll go to one. Okay. So in May, uh -huh. yeah, there was a con in Birmingham in England um, with some like other Arrow Arrowverse um, uh -huh. people <laughs> and uh -huh. then five legends. Um, uh -huh. And a bunch of us were there. And then while we were there, the guy who like runs the whole thing, he had like mentioned it to Liv and Nick, I think that uh -huh. he would love to do one with just legends because he can see how much the legends fans like love mm. them, you know? Mm. And then yeah. when they were doing a panel, Liv was like, okay, so who's ready for a legends con next year? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it just like kind of happened like that. And then everyone was like, what? That we could do the same thing that we had then, but with just legends. And now they like announced it and it's like official. And I think tomorrow the tickets are like out. So it's happening. Oh. But I think, I think it's November, 2023. So it's still yeah. like, Okay. Yeah. But now that we know that there will be a Legends Con, we're like, we would just love everyone to be there. <laughs> show. But I don't know what is possible. And I know people are busy and whatever, but yeah. Yeah, it's funny. The, the, you know, the writers and I always get together and, you know, have a, have a, have a beer at the, at the bar that's across from where our old office used to be. Yeah, as we were having to clean out our office, you know, we have all this like stuff and it's it's junk to us, but we had this moment of just being like, oh, we should just like have a Legends yard sale and just be like, hey guys, if you want a script or a poster or a, some little knickknack or you know, we we yeah, it's, it's it's yeah, it's too bad that we couldn't have had just like our little mini con because instead you're just like throwing all this stuff in the trash and instead yeah, of being like, oh, I could share it with people who actually like would treasure this stuff. Yeah, um, people would pay for that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys should all come to Legends okay. Con. Is it going to be in Birmingham again? In in Birmingham, yeah. In the same, okay. it's like in this hotel. We're gonna email him okay. <laughs> and be like, invite the writers, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean the writers would be would do so cool. Anything you don't even need to pay writers. If there's an open bar, writers will be there. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people understand that the writers are the people who make the show. I love how much the fans of this show appreciate the writers and talk about the writing and the, you know, the people who are like coming up with this crazy stuff. So <laughs> yeah, it would be really cool to have cons where we could actually meet yeah. you guys and see you and, you know, yeah. thank you. So, <laughs> well, as you'll discover, writers are not nearly so like, uh, gregarious in person as actors it's good it's, we're lucky to have actors be the face of the show yeah yeah, yeah. and it makes sense but yeah it does and you don't have to come i'm just saying it would be cool and I we can never do never <laughs> never been to bring all my yeah anyways well maybe we'll see in the legends con <laughs> in yeah 23 i know it makes me sad to think that like comic cons actually probably happening in a couple weeks now right and to like not be part of it 
it's like all the years that you participate in that being like, oh God, another Comic-Con. Yeah. And then as soon as you can't do it, you're just like, oh God, I really, yeah. I actually enjoyed that. Uh, yeah. It's such a, like a fun way to, again, bring the creators of the show and then the fans yes. together. Yeah. So maybe okay. it'll be amazing. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, Phil. This was Yeah. It's amazing. been fun talking to you. I'm going to try it again. Dia. Yes. Dia? Good. Is that- this is good. Better? Yeah. It sounds like it could use work. Um, but yeah, good luck watching the last 99 episodes of the show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I know I committed to a lot when I was like, let's start from the beginning and go through the whole show. But I'm yeah. excited and I love that people are like enjoying it too. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, cool. I will let you go. And thanks again. And you're yeah. amazing. And my pleasure. It was fun yeah. to chat. Um, <laughs> All right. Amazing. Okay. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. Right. Bye, Phil. Bye. See ya. <laughs>